Tonight, the message is titled, The Love and Righteousness of God. When I mention the word substitution, what comes to mind? For some, it might be what happens when you order online and they're out of what you ordered and they substitute what you ordered for something better. I know it's always fun to hear people say, well, I ordered this from this place and they were out of that, but they substituted it with something that was bigger or was better than what I had ordered. For some of you, it might be players in the final four that you're thinking about who will set up and help, who's going to step up and help their team win by helping take the place of one of the starters. And you never know every year, there's somebody that usually all of a sudden comes to the the spotlight. And there's some big player now, where before they were just sitting on the bench, but they became the substitute that really helped. You know, as we approach Easter, let's pause to remember some precious verses that remind us of our substitute. And that's what we're gonna do this evening. The word Easter is Chaldee for the word Passover. Sometimes people look at that and they say, well, it's just a pagan word, the word Easter. It doesn't even talk about resurrection. But the reality is it's Chaldee for Passover. Now, for us, we focus on the resurrection. But the reality is Jesus is the Passover lamb for us. It's a good word. And rather than being defensive about words that aren't exactly saying it the way we think we would like for them to be said, I would would encourage you to take every opportunity to focus on what Jesus Christ has done. The one who stepped in to take our place when there was no hope that we could ever win. This is called the Passion Week. It's a week where we remember Christ's suffering, his passion. So tonight we're going to look at the love and righteousness of God. I want you to notice something tonight, and this is kind of the big thought for the evening, and I'll give it to you now, and then you can think about it as I talk about it at the end of the time. God's love did not overrule his righteousness, but satisfied it. God's love did not overrule God's righteousness, but satisfied it. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, we read this. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. My goal is this evening to refresh you with God's word and remember what God has done for you. I have no idea how busy your day was today, how many things either went really well, but you've been so busy you don't have time to think about it, or things didn't go well and you're somewhat knotted up about them. And we miss the blessing of a whole week from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. And we miss thinking about what Jesus Christ has done for us and what that means to us. How could God leave past sins unpunished? How could God, for all those centuries, let those sins go unpunished. If God was not just, he would not have demanded that his son suffer and die. If God was not a just God, if God did not make the penalty be paid for the transgression, for the violation, for the stepping over of God's into God's laws, If God was not just, he would not have sent his son to suffer and die. If God was not loving, there would have been no willingness 
for his son to suffer and die. Can you see how those two fit together? You see, God is holy and just. God never sins, and God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, sin must be paid for because God is just. And at the very core of every person, we want justice. Whether it is the court case over in Minnesota and they're trying to figure out, did, did this man do something that was wrong? And if he did, there must be justice. You can't just because you're a police officer get by with doing wrong. The question then must be, was wrong done? You see, at the very core, all of society wants justice. Why? Because we're made in God's image. There are some core values that are in us, and even though we are in a sin-tainted condition, we still, at least for certain circumstances, we want justice. If God was not just, he would not have demanded that his son die and suffer. If God was not loving, he would not have been willing to send his son. But because God is both just and loving, love meets the demands for justice. So let's look first of all at God is just. You've already turned to Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Just so that you see the context, we see in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right, so now you see that the context, what we're leading into. Verse 25, whom, talking about Christ Jesus, God hath set forth, literally publicly displayed, to be a propitiation. A substitute, that's what the word propitiation means, is a substitute. Through faith in his blood, to declare or to demonstrate his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. How can God be just and allow the sins of the past to go unpunished? You see, Romans 3, verse 25, answers that question for us. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God is not unrighteous. God will be just, but God is so loving that his love meets the demands for justice. So notice God's law. If you would turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. What is God's law? that everyone he's created should love him with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their might. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. What does God expect from every one of us? It's not the ideal that maybe, maybe one day, oh, I hope one day maybe to do this, God says, because of who I am, you shall love me with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And what is our response? 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, we love other things more than we love God. We glorify what we enjoy most, and it's not God. Do you see how at the very core we want to say, well, it's murdering, that's the problem, it's this that's the most problem, and Jesus just summarizes it and said, no, the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and we have to look at that and say, have I done that? I'm guilty. There are a lot of things that I have put before God. And you know what that makes me? A sinner. That makes me a violator of God's law. I haven't even gotten into the bad things that I've done because, you know what, the worst thing that I can do is to not let God be God. And what is the just penalty? If God is creator and God is worthy of my respect and my admiration and my loyalty, and I violated those things and God is just, God cannot ignore my crimes. To not punish would be unjust, wouldn't it? That wouldn't be right. To ignore sin would be to encourage it. To say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to... I'm not going to hold you accountable for those things would be, in fact, to encourage other people to do that as well. And what happens in our society today when we do not enforce the laws that we have? We have people running over our borders. We have people that do not fear to kill other people because the laws are not enforced. You see, it would not be just if sin goes unpunished. And to ignore it would be to encourage it. And what's the problem? We already know, it's already written down in the penal code, what the cost of sin is. The verdict of sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Galatians 3.10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Deuteronomy 27.26. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. You say, I thought you were going to encourage us tonight. Do you know what I found? <clears throat> that until we recognize the awfulness of our own sin, we do not recognize how precious our Savior is. Until we really get a grip on the fact that we are sinners. I'm not just a pretty good guy that occasionally sins. I have totally failed of not having God be first in my life. This isn't something that I'm going to try to ascribe to because I've already blown it. I failed. But I want you to see something. God is not only just, but God is loving. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Let's turn over to that passage. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation. You remember that big word, propitiation? It means substitute for our sins. I want you to notice, first of all, God demonstrated his love for us. 
But God commendeth, and that word commendeth in your Bible means to demonstrate, almost like to showcase. It would be like if you built something and you want everyone to see it, you kind of put it up in the air and you put it on something that draws attention to it. God demonstrated, God commendeth, God showcased his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Anytime we have a tendency to say, well, I've just not, one day I'm hoping to be good enough to get saved, we've missed the whole point. Christ died for us. He showcased, God showcased his love for you and for me while we were yet sinning. It had nothing to do with, did we repent enough? It had nothing to do with, did we figure out how to be good enough? One day I hope to make it to this level. The reality is, God showcased his love. He wanted you to see big shining lights. This is how much God loves you. While you were sinning, he sent Jesus Christ to die for you. God's demonstration, but I want you to notice God's propitiation. That's a really good word for us to learn. Propitiation, or to propitiate, is to remove the wrath by providing a substitute. That's the reason why we love to quote John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which is the substitute for the whole world, which propitiates for the whole world, which taketh away the sin of the whole world. We're celebrating Easter because we're celebrating the most incredible Passover where we deserve the judgment, but because someone else's blood is on our doorposts, we live. We only recognize the amazing love of God when we recognize the awfulness of our sin. How did Jesus say it? The one who's been forgiven the most loves the most. And I think what's happened so often in our families, with our children, in our churches, with our church members, is we've forgotten how much we've been forgiven. Why did Jesus die? He died to take our place. Jesus was not a victim of unfortunate circumstances. He was not a prisoner. Who killed Jesus? That's always been one of those questions that seems to trip people up. Isaiah 53 tells us, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Romans 8.32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. How does all this fit together with the wicked acts those men did to Jesus? Let's turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. And notice how God just explains it for us. Verse 27. For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Do you see, those people were responsible for their actions, yet God had planned for Jesus to die for our sins. You say, well then, how could these people have been held accountable when that was what God had planned? Well, I believe the book of Leviticus describes for us what should have taken place. Jesus came into the city, and interestingly enough, though Matthew and Luke talk about how the city was in an uproar, in fact, Luke says, if the people had not cried out, Hosanna, the rocks would have cried out. It was so intense. But the reality is, Mark says, instead of the people welcoming him in, it was late, and he left the city. What happened? The people 
lost focus why Jesus was there. They should have seen that the Messiah was there, the one that would come to save his people from their sins. And had they taken Jesus to the temple just as the Old Testament prophesied in Leviticus what would happen to a lamb, you would take a lamb and they would sacrifice the lamb and the people would stand there with their hand on the lamb saying, this is my substitute. Well, Jesus was the lamb. And they could have received him as the lamb and he could have been sacrificed in their place, but instead, instead of great shame and personal responsibility, it was anger and defiance. They're responsible for what they did, even though God from the foundation of the earth had determined that Jesus would be our sacrificial lamb. It's called the Passion Week as it focuses on the suffering of our Savior, but it ends by showing that our Lord's suffering was sufficient and accepted, and that's what we're going to look at this Sunday. Hebrews 1.3 tells us, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, God's love did not overrule his righteousness. It satisfied it. The love and righteousness of God. 